My name is John Herschel. I am the president of the Board of Trustees for the Cortland Rural Cemetery. Can people hear me? I guess i got to get behind these. Okay, that's the good news. Um, so I'm head of the Board of uh, Trustees for the, the Rural Cemetery. Welcome to our production, the Cortland Rural Cemetery's production of the Teofioga River Anthology. Um, typically, you don't hear those two words together, cemetery and theater production. It's a strange kind of juxtaposition to put those things in combination. Um, but actually, if you follow the cemetery business, which very few strange people do, um, it's not that uncommon. There are um, not-for-profit cemeteries all across the country, including little ones like ours in New York State, who are trying to turn their situations around. A lot of them are suffering financially. You've probably read that we're not the most profitable not-for-profit in the, in the community. Um, but we're trying to right the ship. And one of the things that, has, uh, that uh, cemeteries do, like ours, is they try and re-leverage assets that they have um, or leverage them in new ways. Cemeteries of our, our course, uh, we take this mission very seriously. It's a place to memorialize our, our loved ones. Uh, we take that very seriously. But if you, if you look at the business side of it, the trajectory um, is not very positive. It's kind of downward headed. And uh, so what you have to do is you have to walk through the cemetery and you have to look at, the, uh, look at it in new ways. And if you do that, and I encourage all of you to do this if you get a chance, uh, there are beautiful trees to look at. Um, it's a great place to uh, uh, see history. Um, it's a great place to see art because there's sculpture and there's interesting typography on headstones. And um, so that you, if you just keep changing filters as you walk through the cemetery, you'll see it in new ways. The Board of Trustees has this vision where we're going to try and uh, make sure that the, uh, the community sees us in those new ways. Because if the community knows that we're an asset as opposed to just a, a ball and chain, just a thing that, that has to be supported, if we can turn, a, turn our, uh, our institution into a place to come and view culture, uh, like this tonight, um, if we can have people walk up through the cemetery and actually walk along the roads and actually there'll be, uh, at some point, there'll be um, um, interpretive signs so you can walk around and learn a little bit about the history of the cemetery or the famous folks that are buried there, then that's a learning educational aspect of the thing. Um, we just partnered with the Cultural Council of Portland County. They're housed in the superintendent's house over there right now, so we're putting art in the cemetery. We're going to do uh, music productions. Uh, my, my goal at some point is to have a music series inside the chapel, which you, will, you guys hopefully will see after the, uh, the show. So if we can do all that kind of stuff, we can turn our trajectory from this to this, I believe. Granting organizations, individuals like you, municipalities, politicians in Albany, politicians in D.C., they can get behind us, and maybe we can right the ship and turn this thing into something positive as opposed to something just kind of a negative. So there's a method behind our madness. Uh, that's why we're having this strange first ever, I think, production uh, on cemetery grounds. I'm excited as heck that you guys all showed up and reserved seats and, and decided to come out and, and uh, participate in that vision. Um, so I just wanted to make sure you all understood that there was a, a strategy behind uh, why we're doing this. It's not just this one-off kind of thing. So I have a few people to thank. Uh, the first person is Ruth Whiting. Yay. Now the thing about the Tyofnioga River Anthology is it's Bill Whiting's Tyofnioga River Anthology. Bill Whiting. Um, was a, a very important person in our community. Um, I, don't, I don't, I actually I've never met him, but I know him by reputation. Everybody at the United Presbyterian Church, I know there are lots of you out there, you know him well. A lot of the actors out there know him well because he helps initiate the acting uh, troupe that's basically going to be performing with you up there, to, uh, to performing here tonight. So, um, your, your husband had an obvious and lasting influence on his community. Um, I, I just hope we do the play justice, and, and uh, I thank you for giving us the rights to produce it tonight. So thank you for that. Um, <laughs> speaking of the thespians, and I mean that, there are, uh, there are two groups of people that came together to make this play happen. Uh, one is the, the Trope Troop, which is a group of uh, older folks essentially that operates out of the United Presbyterian Church. They've done all kinds of cool productions. They typically don't perform in a tent like this. Um, and then the other group is, and, and their director, so to speak, is, uh, is Scott Gay, great guy. So 
the other group is the uh, the, folk, the kids from the Cortland High School uh, theater program, and they're directed by a gentleman named Benjamin Wells. Um, the cool thing about this play is we've got these two groups wedded together in a kind of collaborative fashion. Um, you've got the whole range of ages, and the, I, I just think that's exciting in and of itself. You've got probably folks that are in their 80s, I'm not going to say who. Um, and we've got folks, our, our youngest actress is uh, 12 years old, uh, Chloe Van Gorder, who's uh, I think probably in the junior high school. So there's this whole range, and that's exactly what we're trying to do is, is create that you know, collaborative environment here. Um, these are people who are not getting paid, as you can imagine. They don't get these. These are not Hollywood salaries. These are no salaries. They take time out of their days, and, and, and especially the kids who are busy, busy, busy kids doing sports and school. Um, they come up and participate in this. And they learn their lines, and they crash and burn, and they get it all done, and they play music. And you're going to see all that tonight. I just think it's tremendous that we have that kind of, uh, of talent in the community at both ends of the spectrum. Uh, they're willing to give their time, and we're enriched because of that. Um, the Cortland uh, Rotary Club, Noon Hour, uh, gave us a grant of $1,000, which basically puts most of the, uh, the expenses for this, uh, this event. So I'm very much appreciative of the fact that they, they made that contribution. Um, and they also let, lent uh, the folks who are uh, helping with the parking tonight. So uh, hands off to those folks as well. So. Uh, Sharon Stevens is the lady running the camera over here. Sharon's not actually feeling well, but she's sitting in the damp tent tonight to run this camera to capture this, uh, this show. Um, she's also volunteering her time. The show is going to run on Time Warner Cable for channel, channel 2 for a little while, and then we're going to bump it to YouTube, and it'll be on the Facebook page for the cemetery, and uh, anywhere that I can get that thing running, I will get it running, trust me. And uh, enjoy the show, everybody. I'm glad you came. Really. of our famous and not so famous dead citizens all with stories to tell. Let's listen to some of them. In 
Robert Randall. Well, I have to tell you, the Randalls are among the oldest families in the area. We're so old, we go back to William the Conqueror. Yes, sir, we do. Now, Randall was in the doomsday book that William had drawn up with all the names of landowners in it, and we've owned land ever since. We left England and sailed to Connecticut, like everyone else and his brother in those days. But Pap had enough of Connecticut. In 1792, we packed up Lucy and the nine kids and headed for greener pastures. We settled in Brookfield for a while and some stayed there. Esther did, and Prudence. She was the last of the kids. Uh, nine boys in a row and then six girls. Oh, man. <laughs> My memory is getting a little foggy in the afterlife. Six boys in a row and then three girls. Is That's correct. Um, we, uh, we, the rest of us pushed on to Cortland, and we were among the first to be buried up here in the rural cemetery. There's a lot more now. We were prolific. <laughs> William and Betsy... Randall. Some people call me conservative, uh, and I guess I was in some ways. My brother Roswell and I built a general store on the corner of Main and Port Watson Streets and painted it yellow. Guess what it was called? Yellow store. <laughs> we did pretty well, but to tell the truth, Roz and I didn't always see eye to eye. Finally, I built my own store and opened a bank, and I became a damn good banker. I had a huge farm. I was on horseback early every morning, visiting my fields and directing the laborers. I was, my, uh, I was, I prided myself on that farm. Handsome buildings, well adapted to their various uses, good fields, Clean fences, cattle, and horses, and other livestock, and sheep, lots of sheep, lots of wool, lots of money. <laughs> By the time I was 33, I figured it was time I got married. Now, Betsy Bassett was a lively girl, bright-eyed, quick of tongue, better yet, she was very thrifty and a good housekeeper. We lived in a small house, but I wanted something bigger, so William set out to build it for me. God knows by then he had money enough. Well, we built a pretty big house, probably the biggest in Cortland yet, and Ross, he wanted it. He was always like that. Had to have the biggest and the best. Like that awful pew of his in the church. Anyway, he persuaded me to sell him that house. So we decided to build something even bigger and better. And we did. It was magnificent, that house. There were gardens all around. Oh, I love gardening. We had cactus and orange trees growing in the conservatory. And Roz just about had a conniption fit when it was all finished and grander than his place. I was always surprised he didn't get around to building an even bigger and better one. But I guess he was too busy with other things. He outdid us in one way, though. We had three children. He had four. Uh, by the way, that general thing... He always wanted to be called General Roswell Randall. Well, he was general of the local militia, never got any closer to the battlefield than I did. <laughs> general Roswell Randall. Well, William may scoff, but a general I was, and as a general, I will always be remembered. <laughs> and I must say I cut quite a handsome figure, if I say so myself, when I marched into church every Sunday morning with my gold-headed cane, uh, ruffles at the throat and wrist, and uh, buckled knee bridges. Oh, and that pew? It was actually a block of pews. I took the space for eight pews and, and turned it into a kind of a drawing room for the family. Oh, sofa, high chairs, footstools, foot stoves. It can get mighty cold in a Presbyterian church. That's why I had it set two steps up off the floor. Now, I tried to get William to take half the space, but uh, he'd rather sit with a hoi polloi. I suppose he thought that my carriage was too fancy also. It was pretty sumptuous, if I say so myself. I, it had a, a high seat for a coachman and a footman, and it was pulled by four well-groomed horses. 
And when I died, it was sold to a fellow in Ithaca, New York. And some local wags got together and decided that they would have it leave town with a history. So the fellow got the carriage and the story that it was brought over from France by the staff of General Lafayette and presented to Alexander Hamilton. And then after Hamilton Burr duel, which didn't go well for Mr. Hamilton, it came into the possession of the father of James Fenimore Cooper, who gave it to his good friend, General Roswell Randall. <laughs> yes. No, I, not that I was stuffy. I, Lord, no, I, I was a trustee on the original Free Library Board. I, I loved to read. Uh, Shakespeare was one of my favorites. And uh, when I got too old and my eyes got too dim to read, I loved having members of my family read passages from my favorite plays to me. Yes, yes, William's right. I outdid him in family as well as so many other things. <laughs> Wilhelmina Randall. How would you like to be a footnote? That's what I am, a footnote in the book of Randall. When anyone hears Randall, everyone thinks, oh, General Roswell Randall, the showiest man in town. Or Henry S., the famous author of those books about sheep or goats or some animal, heaven knows how he got involved with them. Or the William Randalls, father and son who ran the Randall Bank. But Wilhelmina, Wilhelmina Randall, who is she? Well, I outlived them all. <laughs> Ninety-three years old I was when I died. Every New Year's Day, Alonzo Blodgett, bless his old heart, he was a childhood friend, would dress himself up and come to call in his very best just as he had for 60 consecutive years. We sat in that magnificent mansion and talked of the days when it was full of young people like us, laughing, dancing. Now I'm just a footnote. But if people only knew, I gave the city the land to build a school on. That's right, Randall School. But not the Wilhelmina Randall School. It could have been named for Roswell, or William, or Henry with all of his sheep. No one ever thinks of Wilhelmina Randall. Francis B. Carpenter. I was born just north of the village of Homer on August 6, 1830. One of eight children of Asa and Elmira Carpenter. My father, he was a, he was a hard-working farmer, and he expected me to follow in his footsteps, and I'm, I'm afraid in that regard, I was a bitter disappointment. You see, by the age of eight, I knew I wanted to be an artist. When I ran out of paper, I would draw on anything, field stones, scraps of wood that were thrown away. My father once told me that he was mortified to overhear a trustee of the Congregational Church say to some folks, you can't turn over a stone on that farm without finding a picture of a chicken or something on the other side of it. <laughs> well, my father admonished me, and he told me in no uncertain terms to get that nonsense out of my head. Well, I, I persisted. And at age 13, he sent me off to Ithaca to a grocer to have me learn how to be a merchant. Six months later, the grocer sent me back to Homer with a letter to my father, which read, 
Frank has shown none of the intelligence necessary for mercantile business. Drawing molasses is not the kind of drawing he prefers. Yeah. You should best keep him on the farm. And that's where I would have stayed. But for Paris Barber. Now, Paris, he was the son of the wealthiest merchant in Homer. And he helped me set up a studio on Main Street. He encouraged all the trustees for the Academy on the Green to sit for portraits. He even helped me pay for one term there at the Academy. He was a good friend. Nonsense, Francis. I was glad to be of help. Why, after that, you went to New York City and made quite a name for yourself in the art world in the 1850s. Soon your portraiture skills are in demand by all the movers and shakers of America. Well, you've done portraits of preachers, politicians alike. Even Fillmore, Tyler, Pierce, Garfield, and Lincoln. Ah, uh, Lincoln. Now, many school children are familiar with his image because of my work. In 1864, I rendered an 8 foot by 14 foot painting of Lincoln reading the Emancipation Proclamation to his cabinet for the first time. That painting now hangs in the stairway on the Senate side of the Capitol building. But you know, I, I just couldn't leave it alone. I kept working on it, even up until the point where I brought it to Homer in 1866 for an exhibition, and then again up until the time in 1878 when the government took possession of it. I couldn't, I couldn't stop myself. I, I kept retouching it. A friend of mine once told me, Francis, you're, you're like a farmer building a fence. One more rail, just one more rail. He saw me working on the painting one day, and he told me exactly what was wrong. He said, Francis, you've regulated and smoothed Lincoln right out of the painting. And he said, this is what you need to do. To put the, the darkness back under his eyes, the wrinkle on his brow, the, the furrow under his lower lip, adjust his chin. And of course, I returned the mole to his right cheek. He was right, of course. But you know what? Before I left this world in May of, of 1900, I made a pretty penny off of the sale of copies of that painting and out of my memoirs, which I recommend to you. Six Months in the White House by Francis B. Carpenters. <laughs> William Stoddard. Living by the river, swimming in the river. Playing pirates and pagans gave my friends and me the wherewithal to greet the day with renewed optimism. To greet the world with the confidence of a blackbeard or a shah. So when I left Portland, I left for all the right reasons. I wrote, I farmed, and I reported on what I saw, but the greatest thing I saw was not a mountain, or a sunrise, or a rare bird, but a man mountain, or a sun about to rise, or a rare bird indeed named Abraham Lincoln. How such a gangly man could woo women and voters alike all across this dichotomous country is a testament how we recognize true genius, even when it comes wrapped in the form of a gangly lawyer. I was his secretary, but I was also his confidant. The things he told me, the death threats he received, it showed me the hatred that can dwell in the hearts of the unjust, that is, those who supported slavery. And Lincoln showed no signs of wavering, no inkling of a thought that he was right and they were wrong, no shades of gray. Shouting the battle cry of freedom. 
Mrs. Sylvania Rover. My dear madam, it is my painful duty to announce to you the death of your good and brave husband, who fell bravely leading his regiment to the bloody battle of July the 1st at Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. I was within a few paces of him when he fell. He was among the bravest of the brave and fell lamented by all who knew him. His regiment behaved worthy of their leader, and although losing more than half their number, fought on through three bloody days and are still ready to avenge their fallen leader and comrades and to restore the government of the Union. Allow me to offer you my sincere condolence for your great loss and to assure you that he died in a glorious cause and without fear or murmur. The body was buried on the field with the men who fell by his side. We could do no more. I am very truly yours, L. Cutler, Brigadier General, Commanding Brigade. I'd actually received word of his passing a few days earlier. My dear husband, Major Andrew J. Grover, had been taken from us for a cause. But what cause could be more worthy than the need of his family who loved him so? He lies in eternal rest above us on the hill. I asked God through my tears how he could take such a good man of God from me and our three small daughters. When he was wounded in Virginia in 62, <laughs> and came home to Magna, I thought my prayers for his deliverance had been answered. But he talked about the tribulations they faced and how valiant his men had behaved and how proud he was as their leader and how this war to save the Union required great personal sacrifice there was no holding him. In the spring of 63, he left us and went back in the army again. But in the end, how could I fault him? That which took him away from me is what I admired most. His strength of character, his, his devotion to his duty and to others. He was a good man. He loved us. He loved God. He loved his country. We do miss him so. We are springing to the call of our brothers gone before. Shouting the battle cry of freedom And we'll fill the vacant ranks with a million freemen more Shouting the battle cry of freedom The union forever, hurrah boys hurrah Down with the traitor, up with the star While we rally round the flag boys, rally once again Shouting the battle cry of freedom. Mr. David Hannum. Though it never did either of us any good in this world, my friend and fellow banker made me famous for a time. His name was Eddie Westcott. See, he based his book, David Harum, on my life story as a horse trader and shrewd businessman in Homer, New York. Why, I even heard it whispered among the living that years after we both died, they turned Eddie's book on my life story into a radio show and then a couple of motion pictures, whatever the heck those are. But there's one thing can be said about death it provides perspective. And on that score, 
Perhaps the one thing that can be said about me, the most, shall we say, informative part of my life was my involvement and investment in the promotion of that gargantuan fraud, the Cardiff Giant. You see, like nearly everybody else in my day, I was taken in by that very boondoggle. Even though I was known to be a consummate salesman and a sharp dealer, why, I even invested $5,000 in him. That's about $85,000 today. I also kept our genuine giant out of the hands of E.T. Barnum. And I personally exhibited the big oaf in Boston where a team of so-called experts, the, the likes of um, Oliver Wendell Holmes and Henry David Thoreau, tried to ascertain his authenticity by drilling a hole in his monstrous stone head. So what's the moral of my life story? To this very day, that bony giant is lying in state in a museum in Cooperstown, New York, while I, on the other hand, once a living, breathing human being of means and renown, lie beneath lie in a modest grave in Glenwood Cemetery beneath an unremarkable granite tombstone. Say, what is it with me and granite anyway? <laughs> William Shakespeare. Yes, my name is William Shakespeare. I know, I know, I've heard it all before. Oh, I loved your play. What was the name of it? A Streetcar Named Desire or Medea? I don't know. I never wrote any plays. My father was a mason in Auburn, and that's where I met my wife, Lillian. A mistake. And we moved to Cortland. Another mistake. We brought her parents along true and joined the Presbyterian Church of Cortland in 1943. It's in the records. You can look it up. But we moved to 85 Tompkins Street, where Mary Jane Corey lives now. It's in the records. You can look it up. But living with your wife and in-laws can be wearing, so I took off to San Francisco. Thought it'd be more exciting than Cortland. You know. It is true, though. William Shakespeare did live in Cortland. I think. It's in the records. You can look it up. <laughs> William Dillon. I was born right here in Cortland on November 6, 1877. I took the stage in the wonderful days of vaudeville. In my younger years, I performed in variety shows alongside my family, and then it was in my older years, I became a composer. In 1911, probably my biggest hit was released, and I'll play it for you now. When I was a boy, my mother often said to me, get married, boy, and see how happy you will be. I have looked all over, but no girly can I find Who seems to be just like the little girl I have in mind I will have to look around until the right one I have found I want a girl just like the girl who married dear old dad She was a pearl and the only girl that daddy ever had a good old-fashioned girl with heart so true One who loves nobody else but you I want a girl just like the girl who married dear old dad The Honorable Joseph Reynolds In life Folks refer to me as the Honorable Joseph B. Reynolds. And I suppose it was quite an honor to have served Portland as its <laughs> the Justice of the Peace, Constable, Village President, State Legislator, U.S. Congressman, 
and even elector for President Andrew Jackson. Along the way, I served as Brigadier General in the War of 1812, built a fairly prestigious home just down the road here on Tompkins Street, and sold quite a few of my 10,000 acres to Theodore Wickwire. Well, I even managed to found the Cortlandville Academy. You'd all refer to that as a high school nowadays. And even donated and personally clear-cut the lumber for this very cemetery we're all standing in tonight. And I'll tell the God's honest truth. The thing I'm most proudest of, the thing I miss most in my latest years, I still miss from the ghostly fog of the afterlife, those two Holstein milk cows, Daisy and Snowflake, that I drove all the way from Nye, Albany to Virgil, where I had my start in life. Those girls had the sweetest eyes, the sweetest milk, and the sweetest disposition. <laughs> Louis Wolner. All I wanted to do was teach English, which I dearly loved when I moved to Homer in 1930. I loved teaching every day I was in the classroom. But in 1933, I became principal. I didn't apply for the position, but was drafted and selected from among 80 applicants. I was only 24 years old at the time and was dubbed by some the boy principal. <laughs> In 1945, I began the centralization of 27 different school districts. I took scores of meetings with architects in consultation with the state's education department in Albany before the taxpayers were asked to approve the building of an elementary school on the village green and a high school and bus garage on land that was once a strawberry farm. When I retired in 1969, it was among a great accolade called the Lewis J. Wolner Day. There was a parade! My entire family and I viewed from a grandstand built up at the high school and erected on the village green. High school band supplied the music, followed by officials of the village of Homer, some members of the Board of Education, the Lions Club, Boy Scouts, even some members of the Microd Club. <laughs> Louis Fulmer was master of ceremonies. He introduced Carl Edlund president of the Board of Education, who unveiled the portrait that was to be hung in the Board of Education room, along with other worthies in the Homer educational system. When I died in 2001, they laid me right across from the high school that I helped to build. And when Bill Whiting went up to the high school to request my portrait to illustrate a talk he was going to give on me, nobody there knew where it was or who I was. It's raining, it's pouring, the old man is snoring. He went to bed and bumped his head and didn't get up in the morning. Elmira Crouch. Kid shouldn't play with guns. I may only be 13, but I do know that to be true. Was it really his fault, though? He was just a little boy and surely saw his father with the gun hundreds of times. And why, after all, would the gun be loaded and reach small hands anyway? I feel most <clears throat> sorry for my poor widowed mother, as I was the oldest and a great help to her around the house. It was the 29th of September, 1825. Look, it's John J. McGraw! Yes, it is. <laughs> Life teaches hard lessons, and I learned most of mine at an early age. Now, Pop, he was off the boat from Ireland. He was a, a Civil War vet, and he was a hard case. Now, we were a large family, and we had very little. And when I was 11 years old, Mom took sick and she died. And after that, all of Pop's anger and frustration and anguish he seemed to take out on me. Well, I took it for a year, and then I left. Lucky for me, I was taken in by Mrs. Goddard in town, and. The game of baseball was gaining popularity. I took to it and it took to me. I was small, but I was scrappy. I'm a fair pitcher in school. In my teens, I played for the town team, the Truxton Braves. And Coach Kinney there, <coughs> he bought an interest in a minor league club in Olean, New York. Well, I badgered him until he gave me a tryout and I made the team. I signed my first contract before my 17th birthday. 
But it was my first year away from home. When I, I played terrible. The team dropped me, but I hooked up with another team in nearby Wellsville, New York. Now, that led to playing on the Southern Circuit with a traveling team, and we even got to play a major league club. I played much better. I started to get good notices in northern newspapers, and then I got picked up by a minor league club in Cedar Rapids. Well, lo and behold, one day I'm contacted by Baltimore on the major league. I was playing major league baseball at 18. Now, I played in the majors between 1891 and 1906. Most people, they think of me as a successful manager, and I was, but I was more than a fair player. I was tough. I was, I was hard-nosed. Slid into a second with spikes up, and I wasn't above tripping somebody on the base paths if I needed to. I played to win. In 1902, I got the opportunity to become the player manager of New York Giants in the National League, and I stayed there until 1932. Over my years, I won 10 pennants and three world championships. I was third all time in on base percentage behind two guys named Ted Williams and Babe Ruth. Not bad for a kid from Truxton. Now, if you want to say hi sometime, just tip your hat as you pass by the monument there in the middle of town. Better yet, come visit me in the Hall of Fame. My plaque's up there on the wall with Ty Cobb, Babe Ruth, and all the rest. <laughs> Take me out to the ball game. Take me out to the crowd. Buy me some peanuts and cracker jacks. I don't care if I ever get back. Go just root, root, root for the home team. If they don't win, it's a shame. For it's one, two. Strawbridge. Growing up, people called me an invalid. I was born in 1830 as Lydia A. Hammond, and seven years after marrying my husband, John Strawbridge, we moved to Portland. I began studying medicine, and when my husband enlisted in the Army to help fight the Civil War, I continued my education, eventually graduating from a high geotherapeutical medical college of New York City. I specialize in diseases affecting women and children, but that's not the only way I helped women. I was a suffragist, and I was known to do things people may have found outrageous for women. Like my clothing, some of my skirts were rather scandalous. They only went down a little past my knees. Like a lot of these stories end, though, the, the thing I was studying was the exact thing that killed me. I fought cancer for three long years. But that didn't stop me from continuing my work. I continued helping women until I became too sick and became better. I died in 1904 from my illness. Now I don't know about you, that sounds like a rather valid life to me. Amelia Jenks Bloomer. I died in Council Bluffs, Iowa on December 30th, 1894. But I was born in Homer on May 27th, 1818. I had only two years of formal schooling, and at the age of 22, I married the lawyer Dexter Bloomer. He was a Quaker with progressive views, and he encouraged me to use my intellect and to write for his paper, the Seneca Falls County Courier. Over the next few years, I wrote articles in favor of women's rights and prohibition. In 1848, I attended the Women's Rights Convention at Seneca Falls, and I said, although the doctrine of innate equality of the race has been proclaimed, yet so far as woman is concerned, it has been a standing falsehood. It was there that I met Lizzie Stanton and Susan Anthony, and with their encouragement, I started my own bi-weekly newspaper, The Lily, to promote the causes of women's suffrage, temperance, marriage law reform, and higher education for women. The Lily was a great success, and it quickly grew to a circulation of over 4,000. In 1851, I began to publish articles concerning women's clothing, 
In those days, we wore tightly laced corsets, layers of petticoats, and floor-length dresses. I advocated a looser bodice, ankle-length pantaloons, and a dress at the knee. Much more comfortable, I wore them for years. And all because I wore those pantaloons, people started to call them bloomers. And because of those bloomers, they wrote a musical about me. It was called Bloomer Girl, and it starred Celeste Holm. For a 1940s musical, the lyrics took some risk. Here's one of the songs from the musical. Sunday in Cicero Falls, Sunday in Cicero Falls, with all this underpin in there, who would think of sin in dare? When the angelic call, morals are right, corsets are tight, Sunday in Cicero Falls, the sinners join up with a virtuous fringe, they pass the saloon and with righteousness cringe. Bartender Murphy exclaims with a twinge, Virtue is its own revenge. Sunday in Cicero Falls, no maiden dare falter, no widow dare flinch. Each Puritan buttock is laced to an inch. The boys may be itching, but no one dare pinch. Sunday in Cicero Falls, Sunday in Cicero Falls. Even the rabbits inhibit their habits. On Sunday in Cicero Falls, Sunday in Cicero Falls. The lyrics are sharp with satire, don't you think? After all, as I said so many years ago, the human mind must be active, and the thoughts of woman's heart find vent in some way. <laughs> Iva Garcinetti. I guess I always had a lot of life in me, but hey, there's no time to be dull in show business. I studied piano at the Conservatory of Music on Court Street, but I was never into that classical stuff they taught there. I loved ragtime. I guess I was never really into conventional things. After I spent a spell down in Virginia as a concert pianist for silent films, I moved back home to Cortland and picked up playing the drums. That wasn't a common thing back then, a girl drummer. People must have thought I was out of my mind. But I'll tell you what, being out of my mind got me into a career that I loved. Vaudeville. Oh, what a time. You can't be in show business and not have a good time. My first group, we called ourselves the Seven Brown Girls. Said we were a symphony of tone and color. After I met my husband, Al, we started our own act. Oh, we do acrobats and we have dog tricks, but what really got the crowd going was our European hat growing act. <laughs> I managed to squeeze over a hundred years out of that life of mine. I never really got famous, though. You won't hear about me. Search all you want for the name Iva Garcinetti or even my stage name, Marjorie Miller, and you won't come up with really anything. No, you won't find me in books or papers. But you'll find me here, though. That I can guarantee. But hey, that's show business. <laughs> Bertha Blodgett. It's really by chance that I'm buried here. I lived a good life during my time in Cortland. I was managing editor of the Cortland Standard. I taught Bible classes at the Presbyterian Church, was active in the fortnightly and 20th century clubs, was in the Red Cross, and I was secretary of the Cortland County Historical Society. That's right. Even in our past, we knew our past was important. And don't you ever try to tell me otherwise. I've written two books about it. Let's Go Amazing and Stories of Cortland County for Boys and Girls. I love this town, and there's no place else I'd rather have died. I could have gone under better circumstances, I suppose. You see, I had moved to Hempstead and was back visiting with a friend when I had a heart attack in her home. And now... I'm buried here, with all that history I was so enthralled in, and I couldn't be more proud. <laughs> Mr. Spiegel, Will Cox. I think I'm going to need to borrow that. You <laughs> can. Uh, I'm Spiegel Will Cox. Now, I was 96 when they filed me away in here. And hell, I had a great life. 
I played trombone like you wouldn't believe. Uh, I've played with Paul Whiteman, Jimmy Dorsey, Fix Beiderbecke, Doc Severinsen on The Tonight Show. I've even played Carnegie Hall twice. And you can see me on YouTube performing at the age of 95. Now, don't get me wrong. The rural cemetery, it's a nice place. Peaceful and all that, but uh, I don't know. Sometimes it can just be so dead in here. <laughs> what we need is some music to liven it up. And these things take time. <laughs> Thank you for holding the page. since 1889. Did you catch the name? Charles W. Sanders. You still look blank. <laughs> well, I just happen to be the author of a series of books that every respectable school in the country was using. Here's one. The School Reader, fifth book, designed as a sequel to Sanders' fourth reader, Ivacy Finney and Company, 1863, 456 pages. Part first, containing full instruction in the rhetorical principles of reading and speaking, illustrated by numerous examples. Part second and third, consisting of elegant extracts in prose and poetry with explanatory notes for the use of academies and the higher classes in common and select schools, and that's just one of them. There's Sanders' spelling book, containing a minute and comprehensive system of orthography, and a lot of others. These books were published all across the globe, and you never heard of me? Okay, I was born in Newport, over in Herkimer County, on March 24th, 1805 and moved to Homer in 1814. Well, my parents moved to Homer and they brought me along. Started teaching just a few years after that and kept at it for 17 years, at which point in time I started writing those books, those books that made me famous and rich, I might add. In 1842, I married Elizabeth Barker. And we had two sons, one a doctor, the other a cleric. Pretty good, eh? Funeral services were held July 9th, 1889, right here in Portland at the Baptist Church. Charles W. Sanders. Now you remember that name. Generations of school children did. <laughs> William Ellis. I was born in Putnam County, and that's where I met my wife, Catherine. We moved to Whitney's Point, that's what they called it then, and later Homer, a little house on Grove Street. 
I worked for the Brockway Carriage Company until I was 72 years old. <sighs> One night I wasn't feeling too good. So I stayed in my bed for three days. On the earliest part of the last night, my wife Catherine brought me a remedy. But before I could take it, I was already gone. I hate to think of Catherine all alone in that little house in Grove Street. What will she do without me? Dr. Ambrose Sperry. I just want to say one thing. Thomas Alva Edison was one of the pallbearers at my funeral. And he said that I was one of the greatest inventors of the age. Not only him, but the Emperor of Japan and the Tsar of Russia and many others. My invention of the gyroscope made the piloting of planes and, and boats and, and even spacecraft more reliable. And when I died in 1930, I held over 400 patents. Now, you wouldn't call me a nobody, would you? Well, and I was tremendously interested in my hometown of Cortland. And so I said in my remarks at the laying of the cornerstone of the new free library in 1927, to which I had dedicated $10,000, but let that pass. <laughs> At the time, they were talking about naming the airport after me because one of my devices had been tried out successfully in a government plane. The device, which weighed only 50 pounds, took control of the plane when it left the ground and steered it safely through rough weather. <laughs> now, it's quite an accomplishment for a, for a little boy from Cortland, New York, wouldn't you say? But I had already received a prize from the Aero Club of France in 1914. 1914, mind you. For what? An autopilot. So, did they name the airport after me? No. <laughs> did the city of Cortland do anything to recognize my many accomplishments? No. Portland State and, and Cornell University both named buildings after me. But the only proof of my existence here in Cortland is a plaque that was placed on my boyhood home on the 100th anniversary of my birthday. Did the city of Cortland pay for the plaque? No. <laughs> my daughter and son-in-law paid for it. At the same time, the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, D.C. held a three-month exhibition of my inventions. Oh, by the way, I understand that they recently tore down my boyhood home to make room for a parking lot for a bar. I wonder what they did with a plaque. to my name in my Cortland savings account uh, by my employers at the Elmira, Cortland, and Northern Railroads. Then, one morning, while coupling engine number 22 to a flat car, ah, I'm not going to go into details, but the funeral took place in Groton. <laughs> Thank you. 
Daniel McBurty. I was doing well, too. An industrious and respected citizen of age with a wife and two kids and a house that we had moved to from Marathon about six or so years before. But I had worked for the Cortland, Northern, and Elmira Railroad companies as a night watchman. And the Saturday before, I was taking train number eight at or near the roundhouse, not sure which, down to the car shops near Owego Street. Well, they picked up my body a little near South Main, and I won't go into details, but the funeral was important. <laughs> Jimmy Ryan. My name is Jimmy Ryan, and I obtained a trunk. I had a foreign tenant, and he was a drunk. Well, he worked and went to jail time and time again, and I'm afraid this tale has a more depressing end. Death by train, that's what he had. He owed me money for rent, the poor cad. Well, I kept the trunk. It's pretty nifty. He owed me $17.50. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the conductor tells me we're about at the end of the line. The famous, the not so famous, rich man, poor man, beggar, thief. There'll be room on this train for everyone. So, before we say goodnight, I want to make a special thanks to uh, Ben Wells, who assisted and uh, cajoled all of these students from Portland High School here to help us out as well as John Herschel over there who kind of envisioned this whole thing and, and brought the uh, United Presbyterian Church trope troop down here to entertain you. So, we're going to leave you with a song. You mind if I steal this again? Go right ahead. I don't need it anymore. <laughs>